morning, colleagues. Good morning. And thank you for your patience, as usual. As you can see, our first speaker is Honorable Emma Hippolyte, Minister for Commerce, Manufacturing, Business Development, Cooperatives, and Consumer Affairs. Honorable, it's your time. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Have you fully recovered from an epic jazz session? Yeah. You all have recovered. <laughs> okay. So I hope you all are all energized. The entire nation is energized and now ready to produce. Yeah. Good. So I'm here today to speak. Uh, the first item I'll speak about is a meeting tomorrow, God willing, between the Cabinet of Ministers, the Honorable Prime Minister and the Cabinet of Ministers, meeting with the private sector. Um, and why, what has caused this meeting? Within the Ministry of Commerce, um, every quarter we have an arrangement where we meet with the private sector organizations the Chamber of Commerce, the St. Richard Manufacturers Association, the Baker's Association, Fashion Council, um, Sleazeba, Small Business, and the various private sector organizations to try to understand um, what are the issues that is affecting them and how we can work together to, to energize the business community. And in one of our meetings in January, we raised quite a few issues um, that some of the issues there is, we could address it at the Ministry of Commerce, but others, we felt it was necessary for them to meet with the Cabinet, the Ministers with direct responsibility, for example, of Minister responsible for tourism, Minister responsible for energy, Minister responsible for finance and um, the policies impacting VAT and the Small Business Association. So that meeting is taking place tomorrow. Uh, 10 o'clock at the Finance Center. And I know you, members of the press, are also, I believe, invited to that meeting. And it's just um, making a reality of a commitment we, we made as a government. And that is, in addition to putting our people first, to maintain open communication. Um, we've spoken about collaboration within government, but for our country to move forward, we need collaboration between private sector and public sector within the government. And as a Minister for Commerce um, who represents the business community, we are ensuring that this is taking place, that will take place tomorrow, God willing, at the Finance Centre. I also want to, again from my ministry, I want to remind persons that we have extended the deadline for the micro, small, medium enterprise loan grant facility. Um, and persons must continue to remain focused on presenting their applications. What I do not want to happen is what happened in the first call in where on the last day we received almost 70% of the applications. That is going to cause delays. So we are really hoping, I want to encourage um, John Public to bring in the applications gradually. Okay, um, concerning that, is there a specific department that they have to call because I've been aware, been made aware that sometimes people call the ministry, they ask certain questions, and people in the ministry themselves don't know where to direct them or they just they say they don't have any information. You do not know where to direct them at the Ministry of Commerce? So, yeah. Oh, uh, I'm sorry to hear that. Because I know from our receptionist at the front um, to the driver and everybody else, we have brought them in as a team to cause them to know what is happening under the MSME loan program. In fact, our secretaries, we've put it as a team to, to the extent that our secretaries are assisting in calling persons and things like that. So I'm sorry to hear that. But I want to encourage John Public that they could walk into the Ministry of Commerce in addition to calling. Um, we also, in preparation for the second calling, we had about four online sessions where 
over 200 persons participated. And we're asking those persons now to conclude the application. It's one thing to participate, but you have to prepare an application. And that application um, must be accompanied by specific documentation. I know person, another person who having challenges in terms of um, company registration. Persons, for example, um, may be registered with one name, and now they want to bring an additional person to put onto that company. And I know some persons up to last week were having some challenges, and our officers had to be working with officers at the, at the registrar of companies to try to facilitate facilitate that. But definitely it is on. Um, this year as well, we are this second calling, we are trying to target specific groups as well. We are targeting the differently able. We are targeting members of cooperatives. We are, for example, members of the fashion council, persons who are seamstresses and fashion designers. We are saying, please come on, we are going to give you special attention. Identify persons to work with you. Um, the cooperative sector, both farming and fishing. So we are targeting specific groups to ensure that the applications are completed. So on Minister, time. I wanted to go back to what you spoke about the, um, <coughs> the issues that the private sector members would have raised at the previous meeting you had. Um, you said that's why we, they're having the meeting tomorrow. What are some of these issues they may have raised? And also, what are those well, that the, you could have resolved? No, the issues that they raised that we are going to discuss it tomorrow. They raise the issue of crime, they raise the issue of energy, they raise the issue of tourism and their participation in the tourism sector. These are some of the issues that were raised, and that is why it's important that the respective ministers are present so we could you discuss also, them. Okay, you also spoke of some issues they did raise, but your ministry is able to take care yeah, of that. Yeah, for example, part. there are certain issues they've raised. For example, the bakers would raise certain issues. We deal with that because we are responsible for the purchasing of rice, flour, sugar. Um, for example, you would get some bakers that felt, for example, if there is no sugar or there is a shortage of sugar, um, the baking sector should receive priority. Um, so without sitting at the table, maybe that would not be um, uh, uppermost in our minds. We would focus, when we think of bakers, we think of only flour. But we don't think of bakers needing sugar. So uh, I'm saying this is when we sit at these discussions that these issues come up and we immediately take the internal policy decisions which impacts them. Uh, speaking of sugar, um, are we, I think, stabilized uh, with that product um, coming into the island? Well, it's what, not what? a matter of whether it is stabilized. When you look at the whole issue of supply chain issues, they're not stable. If you look at the news, the war continues. If you look at the news, there's still shipping issues. Um, I can say that there is an improvement. We've had significant conversation up to the level of the Prime Minister here and the President of Guyana, for example, to try to deal with the issues impacting the supply of, of um, sugar from Guyana. So we've put some mechanisms in place. Um, what I can say is we have since um, looked at, we've brought it into CARICOM, we have looked at additional suppliers. Um, we have sat as well internally to look at the internal mechanism within the Ministry of Commerce, the Ministry of Finance as it relates to the procurement arrangements um, and to see how we can fast track that. Um, and in some cases you can do some direct purchases when the need arises, but I always want to remind the public when we go into um, direct purchasing at, in, at short notice, then the price immediately escalates and it hurts the government because the government continues to cushion and subsidize the price to the general public. But I know, for example, an issue that impacted us in terms of um, the distribution of sugar is that even when it was available in the warehouse, if you go to the supermarket, they were still rationing. And, and it was an issue where we had to sit down 
and see what is happening, what is causing that. And um, I went to a few places. I, I was at the counter and they were rationing the sugar. And I had to say, there's no reason to ration. We have sugar. So um, in recent times, as you said, with the, if you have to make a direct purchase, have you had to do that in recent times? Okay? Yes, we've had to. The only reason you don't know is because we didn't increase the price on you. Yeah? But yes, we've had to. But where else are we getting sugar? I know the we were getting some of Belize, am I wrong? Um, we we, we had to get from, well, we got sugar from um, our main supplier, which is at the lowest cost because of the volume, was Guyana. We had to go, we purchased a bit from Jamaica, we have purchased from Barbados, we have purchased from Belize, um, but all the various suppliers, the prices are much higher. So that is why we are trying to negotiate and stabilize in a source where we do not have to go at extreme cost to get sugar onto the shelves. But what's the issue with Guyana? Why can't we... Well, they've said it before. I mean, Guyana has its own challenges. So I don't want to go into all the details, but um, they are a large supplier for the region. Um, but they too had to put things in place in terms of the structure of the organization. We've seen some changes there, um, but... Um, one of the changes I think they mentioned in December last year, they spoke about not no longer selling um, sugar on credit, that it had to be, well, as a direct purchase, you had to pay cash, I guess, up front for your purchases. Is that, that one of that the is, issues affecting us? No, that's not the arrangement we've had with them. And if they say so, then we, we deal with it. But that's not the arrangement. Don't forget the, the, the process is you go through a tendering process. When we need sugar, we put the quantities and the specifications of the sugar that we need out there and persons tender. For example, you sometimes we get white sugar way up from UK. So, it's, you know, it's, it's a tendering process. But again, we must meet specific um, standards for the sugar. Yeah, um, yeah, Madam Minister, um, if you recall some at the last business expo, I think it was in the in the um, boulevard, mm -hmm. the um, emphasis was put on energy efficiency. Now you're going to have this, you know, this meeting with the private sector. Have have there been any um, developments in that area? Is it something that you know we're pushing forward to, especially with digital and technology? Is energy efficiency one of the you know, components for, for business growth well, and development. Yeah, don't forget, yes, energy efficiency is, is high, both energy efficiency and as well as digitization. Because you may recall just last week we had the, we had an event at um, Big Gardens, no, just Big Gardens, just last week, where we had the closing ceremony for a coding competition that was organized by my ministry, the, uh, the Consumer Affairs Department of the Ministry of Commerce and the Ministry of Education. Again, looking at innovation, digitization, and but the coding was looking, using AI, using coding to address climate change. And you had, uh, I think nine schools got um, on mention. You had the um, St. Mary's College having the, receiving the first and second prize and the Supra Comprehensive Secondary School receiving the food prize. So we continue to work in these areas. And, and what you saw again at that um, event was a collaboration between the Ministry of Commerce and the Ministry of Education with support from the Taiwanese mission. And, and in terms of um, cost, the cost factor, there's, there's a lot of prospects for for cutting down costs, there's, you know... To, Very to significant um, prospects for efficiency and less costs when we turn into alternative sources of energy. And that is why the business community wants to engage the minister with that responsibility to know where things are, um, to, because there is a draft act that has been circulated, if they have any concerns on that, how it's going to impact them, especially our manufacturers. We have some large manufacturers that are really waiting to invest in that area. So the meeting tomorrow, God willing, is extremely important for them.
Okay. Um, recently on Facebook, somebody would have made a post in terms of a price discrepancy. They would call Over. it price discrepancy, but it really wasn't a discrepancy. It was that Massey stores in particular had a discounted price, which was the same price as the original. So persons were complaining that this is something that typically happens where um, you see a discounted price, but in actuality, it's the same price of the item before. Um, so there's really no discount. Um, so consumers are, of course, concerned that this has been going on. Um, is there any investigations into stuff happening like this um, or persons making complaints of such happening? And if there is, um, how does the ministry tackle such situations to so ensure that consumers are protected? Okay. We have within the ministry a department called Consumer, a Consumer Affairs Department, and we have officers that actually has the responsibility, uh, officers with the responsibility to walk the aisle and make this comparison. But we also, in addition to that, uh, so persons can actually lodge a complaint to the ministry, we also have, and we are working closely with the National Consumers Association. The National Consumers Association is sort of private, not sort of, it's a private sector NGO organization. Groupings of anybody can join. I think there's a membership fee and you become a member of the National Consumers Association. They too have a mechanism to monitor what is happening on the ground. Um, they too, for example, just last week, what day it was? Last week, within my ministry, we met with the um, representative of the finance community, the banks, and the NCA were present. The members were present. And at that discussion, we were discussing um, customer service, why the banks still have a long line, and making it not too comfortable sometimes for customers, and the fee structure of the banks, and the NCA were present. Again, at our ministry, that's the process. So if you see an issue as a consumer, um, you could come through the Ministry of Commerce, through the, the Consumer Affairs Department, as well as you have this private sector body that you can present to. We also we have a mechanism where the first thing we do, we attempt to bring the consumer, the person with the complaint, with the business party, which is the offender, in. Um, most times they try to, it is resolved before it goes any further. If not, there is also a structure within um, our, facilitated by our um, department, where there's a unit that can adjudicate on things like that. So the consumer must know that they have rights and responsibilities through the Ministry of Commerce or through the NCA. I don't think uh, we've ever reached the stage where there are penalties. There is, as I said, there is a, a body that is set up which has authority under the law, but we've never reached a stage um, where it is presented to them. Most times the matter is dealt with by both parties sitting at the table. Yeah, but as a as a consumer, the issue that you raise, there's something I remember in commerce on your thought commerce, where they tell you to let the buyer beware. So when we are shopping, most times I know even myself, we we are quick to shop. We just pick up things. We don't look at the expiry date. As shoppers, I think we need to to look a little more. Look at the content of the products that we purchase. Do a little bit more investigation. Sometimes we'll put a bit more price comparison where we can so that we understand what we have in our hands. You have the power. You have the dollars. As long as you are, are the one paying, consumers have the power. But just be careful how we do it. Yeah? Okay. Have a blessed day. Thank you very much. I think let you ask questions. Please go ahead. Okay, I, I know we just concluded the jazz, jazz, jazz. Two weeks, is it, of jazz? But my, my question, though, is just to remind the public. Um, 
I mean, this has been hailed as one of the, I guess, most successful um, showing for this event. Um, again, remind us, why is it that investments are being made into this festival? Because people, I think some do have an issue as to why the government is putting money towards it. What are the benefits? What are we getting out of this? Why do we have a jazz festival? Well, I, I think the, that, that question will never go away. Just like you, questions as to why you spend money on sports will never go away. I mean, there'll always be somebody who is not supportive of some aspects of government expenditure. But th there's so many reasons why you should support the Senator Jazz and Arts Festival. Um, you start off with a very clear understanding of the value of the festival for the promotion and marketing of St. Lucia. In fact, all social media all over um, it's all about St. Lucia and the Jazz Festival and the success that it was. Even more so this year, we have so many of the artists using their own platforms. I mean, if you just look at the, the interview with Marshall, for example, you look at Davido's, you, you look at Chloe Bailey's, and you look at all of them, the, the reach and the extent to which St. Lucia is being marketed and promoted by those artists um, is phenomenal. But what is different it's not just that they went to St. Lucia to perform, but the experience that they had. So for example, Marshall is still in St. Lucia. He, he's spending extra time here. He'll be writing over the next few days in St. Lucia um, for next year. Um, you know, a couple of other artists, of course, there's only so much we can say about the, because of their own privacy, whatnot. You know, totally in love with St. Lucia and the experience they had, how they were treated. And the St. Lucian experience, I mean, if you just look at David was postings, for example. Uh, and that is immeasurable, significant coverage that St. Lucia gets in terms of marketing and promotion. And then you add to it the visitors who do come to St. Lucia. Um, when we, we sell tickets and we check online, um, almost 50 nationalities, 50 countries, persons bought tickets from um, coming to St. Lucia. So it's a significant um, benefit in that regard. We've not seen the final figures as yet, but surely um, it brings tremendous economic benefits directly um, in, in persons coming into the country. Then you add to it the economic impact, how it filters throughout the economy, various sectors. So you have visitors coming in, spending money, renting vehicles, going to restaurants, um, you know, going to different events and, and spending. And that itself is a no-brainer. You, you cannot argue with that. I mean, if you invest eight million, whatever, in a festival, and the spend by visitors alone is close to 20 million, is a, a no-brainer. But then even more than that, when you add in the community festivals, that that benefit is not just a cash rich grocery benefit, but it filters down to the communities as well. When you have 5,500 people in Sufre, you know, for the Sufre Jazz, it, it filters throughout the, the, the local economy in Sufre. When you have it in Deriso, even in Bexo, which is a new event, you can actually feel the, the spread and, and the filtering down of the, the, the benefits, um, the spend. You know, I, I, I tell individuals sometimes, and, and then when you reflect on it, and it was probably best shown, say, in, in the UK after COVID, when all the pubs closed down, the shock it gave to the economy and then people a lot of people realize and you know when you shared an article with them how widespread you know from the caterers um the the, the vendors the hairstylists the persons the, the designers the seamstresses the nail therapists you know so many different aspects the suppliers who provide tents and provide stage and music and the, the bus drivers um you know there, there's so much that goes into that associated economic activity that brings tremendous benefits to the country, tremendous benefits. And then you, you, you take it further, creative industry, the development of our creatives in the country. Look at the number of young artists in San Lucia that got an opportunity to perform, earn some money, um, their own professional development and throughout the island throughout you that's in you know I, I was really impressed for example Kingdom Night you know the, the first act we had 
um, the St. Lucian you know, group, the Rosalie Babono joint group, um, who perform on a big stage for the first time, and they, they were excellent. It now opens the door for them to develop as a gospel group, and you never know where next they can go, because their performance is in globally now. And the quality of singers we had in that group, they, they now expose globally. Um, you, you look at even someone like an Ezra, who's a seasoned performer. But his performance at, at main stage showed that he's at, a, at that level where, you know, you never know where, where is the next step for him. Um, so I think in terms of the creative development, it's phenomenal what's happening. The exhibition by Xavier at Orange Grove, those of you who have not been there, to go and see it. This is St. Lucian. This is something we are hosted. I shared some of the photos of the exhibition. I have friends overseas who asked me, where is this exhibition? I said, it's St. Lucian. They asked me, St. Lucian? You know, like they couldn't believe that what was presented, which is at world class, that we were doing it in St. Lucia, and that there's somebody in St. Lucia with so much art that can be put on, on display. Um, the spoken word under the arts component of the festival is growing. Um, we had so many performers from outside, and it will continue to grow, and next year it will be even bigger. The Big Drum Project, you know, which for me is a very special initiative to revive drumming in St. Lucia, and it builds on what we did during, during Creole Heritage Month in Bellevue, the drumming festival. So you can imagine for October this year, you have drumming groups from all over Africa, the French actually saying they want to come to St. Lucia because there's a vibe, there's something happening in St. Lucia. So Jazz on the Square, I mean, it came back, and I, I think it will continue to grow. Um, so th th there's so much. You just watched yesterday, 12-year-old, you know, who will be out in on stage with Jab Duplessy, 12 years from Soufre, blowing that saxophone. You could not help but get goosebumps that a 12-year-old primary school student from Soufre can be on main stage. Secondary. Secondary, sorry, Soufre secondary. And play like he did. I mean, it just tells you about the talent we have in St. Lucia, and this is an opportunity to allow for the talent to develop and to give them that confidence and to let them realize that they can be world-class too. Um, the sky is the limit for him. So, you know, this is a festival that is owned by St. Lucians, and you see it for the community festivals. The community takes a pride in organizing their community festival and welcoming people to their com community. I mean, the way they are so welcome individuals, Bexon, I mean, again, you felt the community pride that they were hosting an event and welcoming people to their, their community. And the community festival will increase next year because Babono did not come off this year. Oh, and Fodor came back, let me tell you. Fodor blew me away. I mean, I hadn't been to Fodor for a very long time. And just to see Fodor and to enjoy the ambience and the setting was fantastic. Um, so you, this is going to grow even more next year, I can assure you. There will be a lot more community festivals next year. Again, putting forward local talent. Almost everyone who performed on stage at Deriso before WCK and um, Winning Flames was from the local community. Uh, and, and that will continue to grow. So I, I'm really satisfied that the Jazz Festival um, plays a very critical role, both in terms of our economic development, but also to it as about creative arts development. And, you know, it's a no-brainer. Anybody who thinks they can do it with the Jazz Festival will always pay the price for doing so. How much did the government invest this year in the festival? Well, I haven't seen the final figures, as you can imagine. Um, today, everybody is just trying to pull the ends together. Um, so I can't give you you know, a, a definitive figure. And of course, we have the arts component and we have the music component. Um, we, we still have some challenges, major challenges. As it gets bigger, traffic management is going to be an issue. And well, transportation, event transportation is going to become an issue. In most venues you go to, whether it's a stadia or entertainment centers, you have multiple points of access. <laughs> Pigeon Point has one road. Of course, we have the sea, which we're trying to develop as an option. But you have one main road to get to the venue. So moving 10,000 people, you know, to an event. And St. Lucians have an impatience when it comes to those events. As soon as they get out of this venue, they want to jump on a bus and take it straight back to their homes or go into their car and drive straight to their home. But it doesn't work that way. Um, so it poses a lot of challenges for us on Friday. And of course, you had Friday, grossly Friday night. So that itself poses challenges. But I think by the Saturday and the Sunday, we got a 
traffic management right. The pack and sale, we still have a lot of work to do on it. Um, somebody was complaining to me about, you know, when they got off the pack, they went on the jetty, there were no boats for them. And I just said to them, you have to wait, you know, because the first, the first wave went and the boat has to take them to the marina and then come back for you. You can't, as soon as you walk onto the jetty, to just expect a boat waiting for you. It doesn't work, so you have to wait. And if it takes 25 minutes to the marina and 25 minutes back, it means 15 minutes you have to wait. But you have to get that into people's minds. But it also means we now have to put additional entertainment. It's something which we did in Cricket World Cup 2007, why we built the promenade. So as you were leaving the cricket game, we don't want everybody rushing the buses. You have entertainment along the route that will occupy you and kind of delay departures. Um, we might have to invest some more in that, especially after the concert has ended, so, you know, to entertain people so it delays their departure. Um, but of course, the crew has to clean up. You have to get ready for song check in the wee hours of the morning. So, you know, you, we'll have to think it through. But as the festival gets bigger, we have to make sure the experience people get is a fantastic experience. Um, and the different components of it that we have to continue to work on. But I really need to thank everyone, the support services, the police, the fire service, the, the nurses, the doctors, um, events company crew, SLTA, um, staffing, everyone who worked so hard um, to make the weekend a success. There was not one major incident that we can report on, not one. Um, it, it was well managed. Everyone worked so hard um, to, to make sure it's a success. And I, I really have to thank everybody, all solutions. Uh, and even those who are critical, continue to share your observations and your suggestions because it's the only way we will really get it right. That even in the criticism, you know, there are sometimes very good suggestions as to what we can do better. So, I, I mean, I, I don't have a problem with some of the criticism. Um, let it come and, and we will continue to work on it and tweak it until we make it right. We already start planning for next year. I can tell you we have some exciting, um, you know, components for next year to make sure we continue to grow and the festival continues to be um, one of the best festivals. Another interesting and welcoming um, feature this year was we start seeing the regional um, you know, component coming back in because post-COVID, you know, and for the years we did not have the festival, the regional participation was not really there last year. And we noticed this year a lot of French and Trinidadians, um, you know, Barbadians coming over. And I think it will grow even more next year as re regional connectivity improves slowly. And I'm, I'm really excited about it because St. Lucia Jazz Festival had that reputation, not just internationally, but also regionally. And we're already getting calls, you know, during the festival from other countries, other persons from around the region that want to come and perform, you know, at St. Lucia Jazz and Arts. So we have to tell some of them, no, no, you'll have to go to a community festival um, because there's only so many acts you can have. But we'll continue to work on it. Um, and we start getting ready for Carnival. The first Calypso tent is this weekend. So um, it's going to be another exciting two months as we build up towards Carnival. But the Jazz Festival, I think from all accounts, um, was a tremendous success. Um, the traffic, like I said, was a major headache on Friday night, but we worked hard Saturday morning to, to get it adjusted and co corrected in time for Saturday afternoon, and, and I think it worked. Yes, sir. Um, in terms of the, um, the production aspect, we we saw you know we saw a lot of developments. Even the, the, the ambience at the at the park yeah, was yeah. different. Yeah. Now, and then you have even the, the, the outside parking. Yeah. So there was a lot of developments that, but in terms of the, the cost factor, how do you factor this in? They, are there private contractors? Are they, you know, semi-contractors? And who, 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 who supervise? I know Events St. Lucia is involved, but in terms of the, the, the financing and the cost and the management, who does the tourism ministry, who, who really, um, you know, supervises this whole setup because you know it's a lot of people yeah. involved in this. Well, I mean the Central Tourism Authority, they're the executive producer. So essentially they conceptualize the, the, the festival from the music side in terms of how they want it, you know, brought forth to the, the patrons. 
the executing agency is events company of St. Lucia. So they are the ones who make sure the setup is there and all the arrangements are in place from an event management perspective. But from a conceptualization perspective, the tourism authority does it. So they drive the financing of everything. You know, government gives an allocation of eight million dollars for festivals, not just the, the jazz and arts, but to support the other festivals as well. So they have the resources to do so. And events carry the event management costs. And the, the arts component is the Cultural Development Foundation. So they will put on um, the arts festival in entirety. What happened? Arts in the City, the exhibition, the spoken word, the Cultural Development Foundation are the executive producers for that component of it. So you have three major entities working there. Central Tourism Authority for the music side, you have um, the CDF for the arts side, and the events company that does all the event management. I, I didn't even speak about the Pure Jazz. This year we added a new, another day for Pure Jazz. Last year we had one, this um, year we had two. And the pure jazz was simply pure. I mean, um, Samara Joy and the first day night was really good. Alison Markey on the first night um, really showed his class as a, a maestro. Um, and the pure jazz really added that finesse um, to the festival. Yeah, so that, that, that's how it is done. And, and since you mentioned the, you, you spoke a lot of the development of the local artists, you know, coming on stage. I mean. This is a, these are like a curveball. We've, we've spoken about it before. But in terms of the Lucian talent now having a stage to showcase, you know, because I mean, we have jazz once a year, carnival, but would there be like any occasion where, you know, you have a, a Lucian talent on this, this national day or some day? Yeah, we have, have it throughout this? the year, throughout the year. Yeah. For emancipation, you see Lucian talent. For carnival, you see Lucian talent. For jazz, you see Lucian talent. For um, you know Creole Heritage Month, you see Lucian talent. Let me tell you, I don't think the creatives have ever had it so good. I mean, in terms of op continuous opportunities. Um, but I mean, everybody wants more. I mean, let's not run away from that. Um, and especially when it becomes a livelihood, you want it sustained. Um, so. Yeah, there are a lot of opportunities now, and we'll continue to create more opportunities. Uh, for the next two months, uh, until um, July 15th, there'll be a lot happening in terms of Panorama, you know, Junior Panorama, Junior Calypso. Um, two weeks ago, we chose the finalists for the um, Junior uh, Secondary School and Primary School Calypso competition. Um, there's a lot that's going to happen for the creatives and for St. Lucian musicians. I mean, some of the guys are already reducing, um, producing the music and releasing it um, for the season. And as soon as Carnival finishes, we go straight into Creole Heritage Month and, and everything else. So, yeah, there are a lot of opportunities being created. And government is showing the lead, but, you know, other entities and other interests can come to the fore as well. It cannot only be government. And if government does not organize something, there's nothing happening. And we talk about the, the National Museum or, or you know, this National Auditorium. Mm -hmm. is, is this something in the working? Well, well, it is. I mean, we, we still have as a priority the establishment of national uh, performance um, space. And although what we will be doing during this year is to start building some community spaces. So we'll be putting an amphitheater in Serenity Park. We'll be building one in um, Bellevue. The Fisherman's Village in Banan will have a performance space. So there'll be a number of performance spaces created um, throughout the country um, to give our creatives you know, the infrastructure for at least for them to, to practice and to, to develop their craft. So yes, that will happen. What are your thoughts about the, um, I think there's a complaint um, that the Pigeon Island landmark, well, the National Trust wasn't getting top dollar to, for, well, they were not being paid top dollar for hosting the event there. Um, I'll be making a statement in Parliament on the National Trust and the future management of the um, Pigeon Point from a tourism and event perspective, because I believe we need to take a very, um, yeah, look a very frank look up how it is managed and what's happening, because you know there's a lot being said. There's a lot we went through 
in the last few weeks to get this festival off the ground. And today is not a day for it. Um, but I can tell you, there will be a very serious look at how we move forward. Because the Pigeon Point also serves as the premier site for weddings in St. Lucia. And there are a lot of complaints and negativity about you know, what's happening there now and the support that's given. The event promoters don't even want to go to Pigeon Point anymore. The tour operators don't want to go anymore because they have so many complaints. So we need to take a look. But I, I think it should be a public discussion um, as to how we move forward with Pigeon Point because it is a historical site which has to be preserved. But it's also a national park which must be accessible to St. Lucians to use it in a, in a responsible way. Um, I don't think we should be pushing out you know, St. Lucians from the park and pushing out all certain activities from there. We have to find a way to manage it properly. And, you know, that, that has to be a very open discussion. And let all ideas content. My, my approach is to say to everybody, put your ideas on the table. And collectively, let's bring all the ideas together and decide the best way forward. Uh, we cannot have a small clique, you know, deciding that they alone have the right to, to say what happens and what doesn't happen. But that discussion will start very soon on how we manage um, Pigeon Point moving forward. Um, I, I, I cannot support that we should no longer have jazz at Pigeon Point. Yeah. I have a question. So we would have seen a post made to social media. Again, it's coming from the Church of God, Seventh-day Adventist Church. Kingdom Night was largely celebrated um, for what it represented including religion into the jazz and arts mm. festival. However, the church did make a decision um, to put some of its members on probation. Um, they did state that they will be making a public statement in regards to that situation. However, it's kind of like the government made the effort to include it into the program, and now you have persons being almost victimized in a way for attending the show. Just as a person, how do you feel about uh, that happening? I, I'm glad you said as a person. Um, I, I don't know which church put it out, to be honest with you. I, I read it, and I'm not even sure. Um, I heard that, but I, I don't know for a fact. Um, and I, I, I've learned to leave things of, the, of that nature for those better suited to, to comment on it. Um, and that's for the spiritual leaders to comment on what should or should not be. But I think, as a person, as you ask, um, it's fantastic that we have Kingdom Night. Um, for Christians who to come and celebrate their faith through song and music. Um, if there are churches that believe you should not um, celebrate um, faith and spirituality through song and music, that's their teachings. I respect it. I, I wouldn't be going to that church, but um, it's, their faith, it's their preachings. Um, and if the church says you should not go, then I guess you might have choose the church. Or whatever. I, I, for me, you know, I, I, I don't know. That's for the church to, to decide and to, to guide its followers accordingly. Um, I thought the night was fantastic. I enjoyed it. Um, and we're looking forward next year to have an even more exciting lineup um, for Kingdom Night. Um, I don't know it's reached a point that most Christians in St. Lucia do not support Kingdom Night. I don't think that's the situation. In fact, by the turnout and the way persons enjoy themselves, I believe there's a strong support for Kingdom Night. Um, and for sure, it's going to stay on the agenda for now. And if any church wants to discipline their member, members for participating, um, that's their, 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 their own choice. I, I won't even get involved in that. Yeah. Um, recently, we yes, saw... You want it? Uh, on, on that note, you've mm. mentioned that without you're planning for next year. Mm. As a Christian myself, uh, what's the line of like? Ah, yeah, for next year. But who would you like to see? Who would you? Um, I would love to see Ada. Yeah. Ada and um, yeah. um, Mercy Chino. Mercy Chino? Yeah. yeah, Ada for sure. I, 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 I love. Yeah. yeah, I'm not so familiar with the second name, but Ada for sure. Jesus. Yeah. Yes, 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 you're right, you're right, you're right. Yeah, yeah. But I, I mean, feel free to share your ideas, uh, because um, 
next year we are, the team is already working on options yeah. uh, and you know who, who to come Sure, I will be the first one. I will be working that night for sure. I will be there. All right. Yeah. You have an agent already? Yeah. Yeah. So we saw the um we saw a, a show, a burner boy show, and, and he used some expletives. I remember last year there was some controversy with expletives. Mm. Do you think, from a tourism standpoint, we need to review the laws pertaining to that, or if anything, create um a certain policy or legislation for performing arts, so not just for musicians, but let's say for spoken word artists, you know, if, if, if there is, um, so to, to guide their conduct, what they say, how they act, and that sort of thing. Well, I think it's against the law to use obscenities in public. That's, that's already the law. So, I mean, whether it's in, on a stage or even by the roadside, you know, it's already illegal. Um, and that's just the, the, the point. However, sometimes, you know, you, you, you have certain um, licenses you give to performers, you know, it, it, when they perform. It's a different thing to somebody deliberately using obscenity to insult, you know, their audience, whatnot. I mean, the police can intervene and, and charge you. Um, some songs do include obscenities in their, in their lyrics. And of course, you know, if you're having public broadcasts, you need to remove. Uh, and there are established ways in which it is such is done. Um, we will never encourage any artists coming on stage and abusing the audience or surely um, using obscenities. And if, if it is something which is sustained, the police should get involved. Um, and that's how I feel about it. Um, of course, there are artists who have songs that do have, and increasingly so these days. We know we take a very firm stance when it comes to violence and lyrics that promote violence and the use of guns or whatnot. We don't want them performing in St. Lucia, um, period. I mean, for, we, we are aware of the influence that it can have on, on, you know, on the audience, but we would never support it or allow it to happen. In St. Lucia, just recently, I think they put up 50 cents. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, some countries they, they, they have no issue with it. I mean, guys go on stage and they say the, the worst and most vile things, um, and it's allowed because that's the culture of the place. That's not our culture. You don't go on a stage and use obscenities and, and insulting language. You just don't do it. We, we don't allow that in our country, and we should not um, allow it. So it, it will be stopped. Um, um, again, recently we heard about some threats from North Pakistan to Cricket West Indies, threats of violence and so on. Um, what measures have the government put in place? I know you guys passed recently the the World Cup legislation, but what measures are being put in place to ensure maximum safety um, for this year's World Cup? Well, I mean, they, 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 there's a lot that is in place and has been put in place. Obviously, I cannot give you a detailed account of the security measures and the intelligence um, measures that are in place, but the point is, you know, there, there's quite a lot um, that has been done. And we've been through that before. We did Cricket World Cup in 2007. We did a World T20 in 2010, and I was involved in both of those um, previous tournaments. And similarly for this tournament, there will be um, the infrastructure put in place both locally, regionally, and internationally to ensure the safety of the games. And, and I have no doubt in my mind that everything will be done um, to make sure that you know, patrons who do come in will be safe and secure. But a, a lot will be put into place. Lastly for me, in terms of the logistics of the event itself, because every year you would find that the structure is different, because last year you would have food and drinks to the back. This year it's, it was more yeah, to the corners. Uh, uh. And to me, it did pose kind of an issue, because if you'd walk down the hill, you'd realize it was quite empty. If you'd walk to the side, quite empty as well. So it's almost like the persons who did invest, because they would have had to pay for their sports, didn't get maximum returns because persons didn't want to leave their spot in the crowd or cross the crowd to go to the too far ends of the park to get food and drinks. So 
um, generally, how is this considered, and is there any opportunity for them to pitch on how they think the structure should should look? Well, what was done this year in terms of the concession areas was what was traditionally done many years ago in the early stages of the festival. You actually had a concession, a village, where people go and get the food, the drink, um, and usually you go for your food and your drink in between acts. You know, in changeover, everybody goes to get something to drink and eat and come back. Um, last year, we kind of changed it a bit. Um, but there were too many complaints about it. And also, too, for some little safety reasons, you know, you don't want to mix food and drink service with the crowd. You know, especially when you have a packed crowd. Um, so there are some issues with that. And, and again, we will look at it and to see how we can massage it and make it really work. Um, what we can do, and in fact, some of the vendors were speaking to me last night, is to probably have screens in the, in the concessionaire village to really establish it as a proper village with sitting, um, really. But again, the, you have to work with the National Trust to get that done. And that's where some of the challenges start coming in. You can actually create a concessionaire village with screens. So while you're taking a little break, you want to eat something quickly, drink something, um, you can sit there and watch the show still going on and then go back to your place, you know, rather than wait for an act to finish for you to go and get something to eat and drink. So the use of more screens, although we increased the number of screens this year, so the concession is to the top, at the far end we had a screen for those at the top. Um, but those at the bottom, we didn't have a screen there for them. And it's something we can look at and, and you know, to improve it next year. So constantly we have to tweak it and tweak it and see how we can get the right setting as the festival grows to ensure people have an enhanced experience because you're right some people want to still while they're waiting for their drink you want to be watching what's going on um but we'll have to work on it i mean those of you who go to cricket i don't know how many of you have been to cricket at darren sami in the early days half of the crowd is under the stands you know having country and western dance playing dominoes while the game is going on because for us too it's also a lime huh? it's a big lime you know you go and hang out with your friends you lime you drink you eat okay i want to have baby face then i go in the crowd but those are the acts now nah, i stay by the bar you know different people have different habits when they go to those events um i guess i want to update on two matters within the tourism sector and also First off, you're supposed to be meeting with um, members of the private sector tomorrow. As part of, well, the whole cabinet, I think they said, meeting tomorrow um, uh, to address issues that the private sector would have raised at um, a meeting in January with cabinet ministers. I think one of you don't know anything about no. that? Well, I missed last cabinet meeting. It was <laughs> jazz, but um, I, mean, I haven't been told that, so... Oh, okay, well, you and your whole team are supposed to be meeting with, with the private sector tomorrow? Yeah, yeah, at Finance Center. Maybe you will find out. I'll find out, yeah. When the announcements are made, I'll, yeah. I'll find out. Um, um, okay, well. But tomorrow I have two exciting tourism. Awesome. We'll, yeah, we're launching our storyboard, storytelling. We're training persons on how to tell the stories of the communities okay. as part of making sure we have, you know, more local, authentic experiences. So you know, training storytellers to be able to build a narrative of their communities and to, so I think we have that tomorrow morning. Yeah. I know the big event for this week is sort of turning for the new hotel at Mont Pima um, on Thursday. I'm sure you would have You're been invited? invited. Yeah, yeah, the media is invited. So we get our... I'll double check, but you should have gotten your invitations right So now. 10 a.m.? Yes, 10 a.m. Thursday, Thursday at Caribbean Jewels. Caribbean. Yeah. Um, that's the at start. The, the actual place, the site. At the site, right? at the site, yeah. At the site, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, um, an update, the Le Pardi, um negotiations. What's, yeah. What happened? What's happened? Well, I mean, we, we, we have done as much as we can on our part. The investor, having gotten the support of government, um, is finalizing the financing of the project. And we're just waiting for them to come back and say, well, look, we're going to start X data or whatnot. Because there's a process, huh? So they came with all their plans, their concepts, submitted it to us. We reviewed it. We said, yeah, we like it, whatnot. They said, what can government give us to make it real? We need to finalize our financing. We said, look, government can offer you A, B, C, D. And they're now finalizing the financing. It will be a huge investment. So it will take a, a while to finalize the investment. But we hope it comes through and that something can happen there very quickly. Um, what about the negotiations with DSH? On that? Well, that one is a little more complicated. Um, 
DSH, as announced by the leader of the opposition, um, has indicated um, that they wish to take the government to arbitration. Um, and we've said to them, well, okay, if you want to. Well, basically, we met with them to try to resolve it. Um, it was a discussion which, I mean, as obviously I cannot you know, release publicly, but we're waiting on them to do what they believe they, they need to do. And we will defend the best interests of St. Lucia, whatever they do. But sooner or later, it will come to a head. Is it, are they suing us or we just, you know, what, what is it? What's the right legal to um, Well, I mean, the, the, the contract provides for when there are differences um, to go to arbitration. So we will, they've indicated an intention to, to go to arbitration. Um, they believe St. Lucia has not delivered to them. Don't ask me what that's supposed to mean. Uh, uh. All right. Yeah. What, are, what are they seeking from signature? To pay them. To pay them what for what? What's, what for what? what? Do <laughs> well, we'll see. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.